I'm very grateful today to uh, begin a two-part series entitled, Do You Believe in Magic? And I'd like to begin by talking about something very sacred, uh, the modern holiday classic, the film Elf. (laughs) And there's a very sacred scene. Santa Claus and his sled with his reindeer have landed in Central Park in New York City because his sleigh runs on what? Christmas spirit. And because of the cynicism and the judgment and the commercialism and the lack of belief, his sleigh can't fly. So it's up to Buddy the Elf and friends to begin to evoke and remind people of the Christmas spirit. And there's a lovely rendition of the song, Santa Claus is coming to town and Santa's sleigh flies again and Buddy is our hero. I would like to tell you that this is a factual historical story, (laughs) but it is not. But the point of my message this week and next is that doesn't mean it's not a true story. Just because it's fictional doesn't mean it isn't true. Shelby Foote was a great novelist and a renowned historian of the Civil War. And he once shared, the point I would make is that the novelist and the historian are seeking the same thing, the truth. Not a different truth, the same truth. Only they reach it or try to reach it by different routes. In this sense, I would say that Elf is more of a true story than most nonfiction books or movies that I've seen because it points to something so true within all of us, Christmas magic, the remembering of the spirit, the spirit of generosity, of unity, of hope, of togetherness, of joy that childlike remembrance that behind all the layers of cynicism and judgment is there longing for something to believe in. That Christmas magic is the most real thing in the world and it belongs to you and it belongs to me. I know I'm about to give a metaphysical interpretation to the film Elf right now, but here it goes. (laughs) Santa and his reindeer symbolize Christmas magic. Buddy the elf symbolizes the master of two worlds. One foot in the magic of the North Pole, one foot in the everyday living of New York City, and hilarity ensues when they combine together. We have his half-brother who represents the magic of children, those creatures that awaken and remind us of the truth. And then we have the sacred ritual of song. Santa Claus is coming to town that helps invoke and remind us of Christmas magic. And so I ask you this morning, do you believe in magic? Excellent. And so consider how Christmas magic might show up for you this year. It's nothing you can make happen, but you can prepare for it. A healing of a relationship that's been fractured. A demonstration of incredible prosperity and abundance. Peace in our world or in a place in our world. Peace and a real, tangible self-acceptance that embraces who we are and who we're meant to be. Clarity of love and of life. All of this magic is possible if you believe. Ernest and his brother, Fenwick Holmes, in one of the last things Ernest wrote, they wrote an epic poem called The Voice Celestial. And here's a little piece from it that you may hear at our candlelight services on the 23rd and 24th. There is no need to leave the world of men nor to retreat to some high cave or glen. Search deep within if you would truly find the springs of life in the eternal mind. Look in yourself and you at length shall view Creator God 
who hid himself in you. Within this precious bowl of alabaster is found the secret of the hidden master. Too long a dying world has longed to see that God, that man and man alone can be. This week and next, I want to share with you rituals of the season. Rituals that evoke Christmas spirit and magic. Rituals that remind us of who we really are. And I'm calling them the gifts of Christmas magic. And the main one that I want to focus in on right now is song. Nothing can invoke Christmas magic like a good song. And so let's start with the one we just mentioned. Santa Claus is coming to town. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. Now, it may be a little bizarre to hear so much about Santa Claus in church. But the truth is, if many of you grew up like me without any religion at all, the belief in Santa Claus really set the stage for my belief in the divine. It's so important to build that understanding that we live in the seen, but we have our being in the unseen. And when we can learn to believe in what we cannot see and understand it is more real than anything, we can begin to bring it forth in our lives in a very powerful way. Something that people often aren't aware of is that Santa Claus, as we know and love him today, is really an American creation. It came through New York City in the 19th century. There was a Saint Nicholas, a Dutch saint, who was aware if children were being naughty or nice, but much more in a pious way. This Santa Claus with the, with the big belly and the merriment and the joy that comes through the chimney and gives gift that awaken children to magic and the truth of who they are really came about through Clement Clark Moore's a visit from St. Nicholas, also known as Twas the Night Before Christmas, and the elites of New York City. It's interesting to note that Christmas time back in the day was much more like Halloween than the Christmas that we know it to be today. In New England, for many, many decades in the early aspects of our nation, celebrating Christmas was illegal. It's because at that time it was the beginning of the, of the harvest season. It was when the beer was most ripe. And it was an adult celebrating holiday. It was a, it was a holiday where the poor appealed to the rich for drink, for food, for gifts. And sometimes it turned into mayhem. Groups of men and women would sometimes break into houses and demand gifts. And it was expected that you'd give them that eggnog or whatever it may be. It wasn't quite the purge, but close. And it created a lot of mayhem. And so it made sense for these elites in New York City to have this Santa Claus character who was focused on giving gifts to children. And it began to domesticate the holiday. He's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's gonna find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. This was a message not just for the kids, but for the parents to behave themselves as well. And so Christmas in so many ways, and of course it was commercialized and materialized and all of that, and it was brought forth by these elites, but it was embraced by the poor and the poor of spirit who loved this idea of this being Santa Claus that would help anyone believe that there's a power for good greater than they are. That there's such thing as hope and magic that can help us live a better life. The person who wrote the lyrics to Santa Claus is coming to town is a gentleman named Haven Gillespie. And Haven Gillespie grew up with nine brothers and sisters in a basement in Kentucky. That's where he grew up, not even in the house, in the basement. And he remembered these myths of a Santa Claus who was encouraging him to be good, and it helped him believe that there was something more, and this belief brought him to Chicago, and then eventually it brought him to New York City once again, where he became a, a songwriter. 
And one day he was on the public transit yet. I don't even think they had subways yet. And um, he was talking to a little boy and he said, are you excited that Santa is coming? Yes, I am. Well, make sure to remember to be good, he shared. And it reminded him of those days in his poor childhood where his mother would talk about the importance of being good and the gifts and the hope that might arise. It wasn't just a belief in Christmas. It was a belief in a higher power that helped lead him through the rest of his life. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Good job. It echoes to me, not just the Christmas spirit, but the Psalms of the Holy Bible. O Lord, you search me and you know me. You know my resting and my rising. You discern my purpose from afar. You mark when I walk or lie down. All my ways lie open to you. Before ever a word is on my tongue, you know it, O Lord, through and through. What's coming to town is a symbol of our own consciousness. Santa Claus could be coming to town, but so could another aspect of Christmas magic. What are you preparing the town of your consciousness for this year? A greater degree of healing, a greater wealth of abundance, a deeper, more profound understanding of who you are and why you're alive. Sorry to be corny, but yes, we prepared the chimney of our hearts for good to come through, and they can meld in with those milk and cookies already in your tummy. (laughs) Robert Fulgham, the person who had the wonderful epiphany that everything he really needed to know he learned in kindergarten, tells us the story of John Pierpont. And John Pierpont, by all facts, was a complete failure in his life. He was a failure as a lawyer. He was a failure as a minister. He was a failure as a poet. He was a failure in in the way that he was not a successful composer. He got a job, luckily, as a file clerk in Washington, D.C., the final months of his life, and he died, by all accounts, a failure. Fulgham tells us he was a failure on all accounts except for one thing, a significant contribution he made to humanity, and that is that John Pierpont wrote the song Jingle Bells. (laughs) He wrote the song Jingle Bells, a simple song, not a religious song, but simply about the joy of sledding in the nighttime Christmas air. Fulgham shares, one snowy afternoon in deep winter, John Pierpont penned the lines as a small gift for his family, friends, and congregation. And in doing so, left behind a permanent gift for Christmas, the best kind, not the one under the tree, but the invisible, invincible one of joy. Thanks, John Pierpont. I had the honor in the summertime of sharing with you uh, um, the spiritual symbolism of the Beatles. And it's really a talk about the power of song, the power of music. Because you see, there's something about a song that's eternally present. A song lives in the present moment. Anyone else have their uh, sense of time thrown off by the pandemic? I did that, and you know, what year is it? I can't tell you. And so I just tell people I live on shuffle, like your iPod. I can live in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, or zeros all in one day. It's all there. But, but the magic of a good song is when we experience it for what it is, as opposed to just our memory of what it is. And in the talk, I got to share how we have that phenomenon of getting sick of a song. And the only way that you get sick of a song is if you're experiencing not the song itself, but your memory and understanding of the song. And life works the exact same way. We live in our memory and our so-called understanding of life, and it gets soured with judgments, with cynicism, with mediocrity, and all of a sudden we're sick of life because we're no longer living life itself, but in our own version of what life is, and we miss it. 
Yes. <laughs> As we hear the choir bell. And, and we miss the beauty of that song. Now, in Beatles, I was talking about music. I get that it's much harder with Christmas time because the songs come up every year. Like, oh my God, Mariah Carey's coming. I've got to hide. I've got to lock away. But if you can bravely step in and hear some of these Christmas songs for the first time, you can realize that they're, that they're prayers, that you can be present to them and they can help you live your life renewed again. Now, I'm not saying you have to turn off the lights, light a candle and listen to Wham's this last Christmas. Uh, but what I am saying is that Christmas magic requires that we let go of our tired imagining and remembering of things and allow ourselves to be renewed by the Spirit. I have a Christmas prayer I'm going to seek to say every day this year. It goes something like this. This year, Christmas magic is my present. I will hold myself to the present and not the past. I will hold my loved ones to the present and not the past. I will hold my life to the present and not the past. And the gifts of Christmas magic will be mine. Does that prayer work for you too? You want to say it with me? Repeat after me. This year, Christmas magic is my present. This year, Christmas magic is my present. Mm. I will hold myself to the present and not the past. I will hold myself to the present and not the past. This one's not easy. I will hold my loved ones to the present and not the past. I will hold my loved ones to the present and not the past. I will hold life to the present and not the past. And the gifts of Christmas magic will be mine. If the holiday tunes just drive you crazy, pick songs of your own that matter and are meaningful to you. The title of this message, which comes from The Love and Spoonful, is a great holiday song. Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones, he once sang, May the good Lord shine a light on you, Make every song you sing your favorite tune. Paul McCartney taught us to take a sad song and make it better. We all have that ability to use that ritual of music, of song, to inspire and invoke Christmas magic. The other gift, and I have three more that I'll talk about next week that I want to touch upon today, is the wonderful sacred ritual of kindness. Basic, run of the day, normal, good hearted kindness. I invite you to think for a moment as we head into the end of 2023. Who was significantly kind to you this year? Who was someone that was significantly kind to you? Anybody got something? Interactive service today. You, grandchildren. Thank you. Grandson. Friends. Friends. Sister. Sister. Husband. Husband. Some of the people are making you. I better mention this person next to me. <laughs> I, I could see somebody. Uh, Lindsay and, and Kelly are here. Uh, you, you made me a homemade card this year that was so meaningful to me, and I put on my desk. Sherry, you're always checking in on me and uh, always there to support me. Miriam, your practitioner heart, I feel your prayers all of the time, filled with kindness. And isn't that a wonderful thing, not only to think about the people who've been kind to you this year, but to let them know that you appreciate and see their kindness. And my prayer for each and every one of us is that we would be the answer for someone else who ponders the same question this year. Kindness doesn't cost a dime. It requires that vulnerability of exposing ourselves. But there's no more surefire method to lift above the cynicism and materialism of our society than to live from that heart of kindness. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol is really a story about kindness. 
The key scene is the end of the book. How can I express in a powerful way the story of a man who awakes on Christmas morning and realizes the miracle of life itself? Who instead of putting at the center of his life money and greed, puts kindness and joy and expresses it in such a way that he is in accordance with his past, his present, and has come to terms with his future so that he can live in greater light and love. Scrooge declares, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. And I love in A Christmas Carol that we're, we're told that that kindness didn't just last on Christmas, that extended throughout his life. Christmas isn't the time that reminds us to be kind. It is the time that reminds us that life is best lived with kindness at the center. Not money, not worry, not control, but kindness. You can practice it today in the grocery store. You can practice it today here at church. You can practice it with your family at home. You can practice it in traffic. It's that ability to move beyond the mundane, mediocre, transactional form of relationships and living to rise above that and let someone know that you see them, that you value them, that you approve of them, and support them in making their way in the world. And it's that kindness that invokes a sense of the sacred and the holy Kindness is so important that the Dalai Lama once said that not Buddhism, but that kindness was his religion. He shared, this is my simple religion. No need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Your own mind, your own heart is the temple. Your philosophy is simple kindness. And so this week in particular, I invite you to embrace the sacred ritual of music. I know music is often in the background of our lives, but we make it sacred when we bring consciousness to it. As the wise sage Buddy the Elf tells us, the greatest way to spread Christmas cheer is to sing it loud for all to hear. You may want to ask permission first. But allow music to fill your car. Allow it to fill your home. Embrace it with family and do it in a, in a way that's sacred, that recalls that inner child within you that is ready to experience a more profound experience of magic. And choose to be kind. Not later, not on Christmas, right here and right now. And what I promise you is that kindness will reverberate It will create a spiritual momentum that will not only carry you into experiences of greater kindness, but that will help you see clearly the miracle of life itself and help you receive it that much better. And here's the trick. By practicing these things, we're not just opening up to receive Christmas magic, but we are consciously creating the life that we want to live. When you embrace the rituals of song and the practice of kindness, you begin to create the life that you want to live. To close with a quote from Ernest Holmes and Willis Kinnear from their wonderful A New Design for Living as we move into prayer this morning. They share the continuing challenge is to increase our knowledge of the infinite, potential which lies ahead of us, and every increase but reveals the more that is to be known. To realize that an infinite artist, the divine creator, the cosmic reality is back of and in and through all our acts is to realize the truth which enables us to enter with joy and enthusiasm into the day in which we live. Each day is a new creation, a new moment for fuller awareness of spiritual reality and a time for designing the new life we want to live. So moving into that place of heart, as Dr. Patty so lovingly set out for us this morning, I invite any of our prayer practitioners who wish to choose us to stand and join me in this prayer. 
Let us fully, transparently open ourselves to the spirit, not only of the season, but of the divine, the truth within us and all around us, speaking to us in so many ways. I want to create a space in our hearts as we move into this time of season. We know it is so often a time when people let go of that mortal coil. And I just honor those great patriots of our country. Rosalind Carter, our first female Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, longtime Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Just honor their commitment to their country and to being the individuals that they are. And I also just want to honor the life and spirit of Richard Clemens, the husband of a retired Mile High minister, Nadine Cox, who made his transition last weekend. I always enjoyed my experiences of him, and no matter what, he always took the time to share how much he adored his beautiful wife. And we just honor his life and all those who love him. And perhaps there's someone in mind or heart today who you've been asked to let go of. We let go of their place on this planet, but we hold sincerely to their ever connection in our hearts, recognizing that in that invisible plane of life, there is that reality that connects and inspires us always. So opening ourselves to the gifts of this season, may we believe in a divine magic that is simply the nature of the divine's expression in bounty, and in beauty, and in love, and in the sacred in this wonderful time of year. We embrace it, we embody it, we are it, and so it is.